Okay, we're recording. And in a minute, we should be live on Facebook. Woo! Okay, let me. There's a little thing in the corner of my screen that says meeting is now streaming live on Facebook. So well, that sounds like a that's a good sign. Yeah, <laughs> we made it. We did it. <laughs> we did it. Let me. There we are. Yes. Cool. Oh. Cool. I hear my dog barking in the backyard. <laughs> Hopefully this audio is going to be just fine. <laughs> It'll be great. Okay. So I think we're good. Welcome, Julia. Hey. I'm excited. I'm excited to talk to you about pain. So many people deal with pain at some point or another. Uh, where are you based out of? You in Colorado? Uh, yes, I'm just outside of Denver. Okay, cool. Is Denver really high up? No, it's it's way down at sea level. Oh, really? <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, 5280 is the height of Denver. Uh, I think I'm maybe just a touch higher because I'm by the foothills. Oh, okay. Very cool. Very cool. Awesome. So you are a pain in fascia expert and it seems like everybody has had back pain at some point in their life yeah including me <laughs> including you i've had back pain at different times too um is there something about us that makes us prone to back pain something about most people's lifestyles uh well for sure, the epidemic of sitting, as you and I both sit here talking on this conversation, mm -hmm. but uh, we're not made physiologically to be sitting as much as we do, and it will cause a really specific tightening pattern in the fascia and can absolutely be a contributing cause to back pain. Uh, we also tend to do a lot of quad dominant activities. So hiking, walking, running, uh, if you're squatting poorly. Uh, most things are very heavy on the quads. And if you combine that with sitting, which is shortening, especially the hip flexors of the quads, it tends to cause all kinds of havoc on your pelvis and can very commonly lead to back pain. Interesting. So it sounds like there's a lot of moving parts. A lot of contributing factors. Yes. But would you say they all kind of tie back to a sedentary lifestyle? Um, no, no. I think it's this combination of a lot of us will go from sitting for work for a certain amount of time and then go really hard at a CrossFit class or go for a super long run, uh, something like that, where uh, you're attempting to do activities that you really want to do, but after you've sort of stuck your fascia in a certain position. So um, sedentary, being sedentary can definitely contribute, but most of the people I work with, in fact, are very active. It's just a combination of either sitting uh, for work or somewhere along the line, one of their habits um, especially if they do something repetitive, like let's say you play golf and you're swinging a golf club in the same direction, the same way every time, uh, that repetitive pattern will tighten certain muscles and fascia in a certain pattern and then cause pain. So I work with a lot of active people actually that uh, somehow got a little rotation or posture that's become misaligned uh, and it's giving them all kinds of pain. <laughs> 
Interesting. Do you think this has been a issue for humans throughout history? Or is there something unique about the modern world, aside from, I guess, well, maybe it is um, what you just discussed, but has this always been something that humans have had to deal with, do you think? My best guess is no. Um, and my, my answer is also related to sitting and adding in the amount of stress that the average person is dealing with today that may not have been so apparent even just 50 years ago. Um, I don't know if it's the internet or expectations, all the content we're consuming, but on average, the stress levels of our society is really high and stress is a leading contributor, not just to pain, but just disease in general. Um, it can lead to all kinds of problems. So I would say that's for sure a difference. I would, I would guess that stress is especially high now based on what you said with consumption. There's mm -hmm. so much data and it's so easily um, accessible and so um, easily uh, present with notifications and everything, news, Facebook, Instagram, and everything like that. Just day after day, you're constantly getting banged over the head with your phone in, in some respect. Um, yeah, I definitely think stress is high. Unique. Even, even when it comes to pain, I have to consistently talk people out of Googling their pain all the time. Because even that is causing stress specifically to pain. You're like, oh, I have back pain. I wonder what this could be. And you type in your symptoms and you start doing that consistently and you see all of these horrifying tales of people that had something really serious or really rare and it's our tendency to want to self-diagnose and bond with those people if you're feeling something similar and uh, that is counterproductive for your stress and your pain as well. <laughs> Absolutely. I used to do that all the time. I'd go on WebMD and just see, oh, I think I got a pain here. What could that be? But yeah, that's definitely fueling the engine of stress and anxiety for sure. Yes, it is. I've done it too. I think we all have. We've, we've gotten to a point where we haven't been able to figure it out. And that's the, that's the most frustrating or potentially the scariest part of pain is not knowing where it's coming from. Isn't there a, uh, there's some quote, it's probably from a Disney movie or something, but it's like people fear uh, that which they do not understand. I, I feel like that really applies to, to pain. If you don't know where it's coming from and you keep searching for all of these different answers, it, it mounts that anxiety and your stress and that fear that potentially it's never going to go away, things like that. Yeah. Wow. And so you put together a pain uh, liberation academy. Yes. 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 <laughs> tell, tell me a little bit about that. How, how long is this program? How's the program set up? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it helps to give you a little bit of my background, uh, just so you know where I'm coming from. Um, cool. When I was born, I had extensive nerve damage happened to my right shoulder, which rendered it essentially useless. So I had a really massive nerve regraft surgery when I was only four months old. And they took nerves out of my calves and rerouted them into my shoulder, which seems insane that if you think about how tiny a four month old baby is, they were able to do that. Um, and overall, it was successful. It helped bring uh, my arm back online. <laughs> so it could move, it was functioning more than before, but I still had a lot of limited mobility and a lot of tightness. And I grew up in the Western medical system being constantly told that this tightness was never going to improve. My condition overall was never going to improve. In fact, it was most likely going to get worse. 
And that is what my brain told me for a really long time. I, I accepted everything that these people of authority were saying. Why wouldn't you? Why right. wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it took a long time to, to realize that I am capable of setting my own limitations. And I was still able to accomplish a lot. Uh, in that time frame. I decided I was going to play volleyball. And uh, I worked super hard at it. I felt that I didn't have to be as good as everybody. I had to be better than everybody. So to make up for this lack of movement in my arm and uh, I overcame a lot mindset wise pursuing this sport that was surely a two arms required type of sport. Um, and I ended up getting a scholarship to play division two volleyball in college, which was amazing. Wow. Now just, just so people understand your arm was impaired. It was, was it frozen to some degree? Um, no. Uh, so it has a really hard time um, lifting up over my head, uh, but it almost used to like, I'm gonna back it up so you can see, it almost kind of, I would hold it like this at a really tight angle. Um, and no one told me, again, that it was worth using, so I wouldn't. Um, I only used it in the sense of being able to pass and I would toss uh, with my right hand to serve. But for the most part, the rest of my life, I was so left hand dominant because I believed there was nothing to be done about my arm. Right. So um, I still felt like I was missing this piece of recovery. And I finally discovered fascia release. It was 2011. So, oh my gosh, I'm not going to do math right now, but uh, it's been. It was a long time of growing up thinking there was nothing until this thing kind of hit me in the face. <laughs> and I saw more improvement in the look and the feel of my arm more than 16 years of going to occupational therapy and consistent doctor's appointments. I had tried physical therapy, massage, chiropractic, most everything you can think of. And saw little to no results every time until this thing. And I got so excited about it that I immediately kind of pivoted my career and went into learning more about fascia release and specifically learning a method called kinetics, which um, I still do in person um, in my practice, which is a form of body work that releases fascia very powerfully and effectively. Um, so was, was kinetics the, your, your first, um, entry point into this fascia release in 2011? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was life. It was life changing. I feel like this had been this amazing secret that had been kept from me mm -hmm. for a really long time. And I, it took up until that point releasing fascia, which I do fully believe helps process emotions when you really get into some of the scar tissue, uh, because I believe that fascia holds a lot of her stress and trauma and anxiety, uh, which is another topic. But um, I realized how angry I was for having to work through this thing at the time, what felt like by myself, nobody gave me any hope. Everybody was taking it away at every moment. <laughs> uh, there was nothing anybody seemed to be willing to do about this thing. And yet, boom, here was fascia release. So I, I worked through a lot of that anger and trauma with this work and just felt the tightness sort of melt away. And I still have some limited range of motion with this arm simply because I 
believe we missed a really critical window when I was really young to rebuild a lot of those neural pathways, but it's significantly better. And I have this feeling in my body of just freedom. Like it was the first time I felt free to try new things and be more confident in the use of my body. Like I started rock climbing and mountaineering and all of these things that if you would have told 10 year old me, I would be like using an ice ax up mountains or rock climbing, I would never have believed it. Uh, wow. So of course I'm really passionate about it. And I realize that what I am especially passionate about is going after those people that have a similar story where they have been told time and time again that nothing can be done about their pain or they don't know where it's coming from. And so they keep getting these really half-assed solutions like a cortisone shot or a couple of stretches from a physical therapist. And I want those people to know that like there is, there are other answers. And I personally found so much of those answers in fascia release. So that's why I built this program to begin with. And that's why it's called Pain Liberation Academy is I want to give people these tools to find that freedom in their body and be able to pursue whatever activities they want and to not be afraid of pain, whether it's currently there or to be afraid that it may come up at another time because that's life. Just because yeah, no. I know about fascia relief, like I still get pain, you know. <laughs> if you're living, if you're living life, you're gonna encounter pain at some point. Yes, but uh, there's a big difference between feeling pain and having a panicked moment, where you're like, "Oh no!" Uh, let's say, I'll use an example from my life. You're out for a run, and all of a sudden, it feels like a knife is stabbing into your knee. Most people would start panicking and be like, "Oh no!" maybe I tore my ACL, maybe my meniscus got torn, I gotta go to the doctor. Like there's all of these panicked thoughts that run through your head. And by understanding more about pain and about fascia and its patterns, I feel I'm at a point where I instead look at that pain with curiosity. Where I'm like, huh, I wonder why my knee's hurting. I wonder if my pelvis has shifted. I wonder if right. my calf is, fascia is restricted. And, and that's, that's what I want to be able to pass on to people as well, is like give them those tools, the information, these resources to downregulate. And I know that's a personal passion of yours too, helping people like bring it down a notch. <laughs> it is, it is. So it sounds like where we started the conversation with Googling, symptoms that's where people start but by doing pain liberation academy you equip them with tools to do their own googling of their body these inquiries into you know what what's the real real root cause of pain you know yeah i love that <laughs> teaching people to be their own google for their own body there you go be your own google people yeah real real quick i don't I think it's, it's probably worthwhile to just explain what is fascia. I think most people know about muscles, bones, blood, and organs, but I mean, I didn't hear about, I don't think I learned about fascia in school. Um, tell us, what is fascia? Yeah, most likely people have heard it attached to muscles in the form of like myofascial. Like you've probably heard of myofascial release, mm -hmm. but um, Fascia is, if you want a very graphic way to think of it, if you've ever had um, skin, skin on top of a chicken breast that you peel off, it's like that little plasticky film layer. Yeah. Uh, that, that is technically fascia. That's what fascia looks like in our body. Um, but I like to also talk about it like plastic wrap. It's like plastic wrap that wraps around every single thing in your body. It is a three-dimensional web. 
So it's not simply a sausage, right? Like it's not the casing that goes okay. around the outside. It goes through and around everything. And people often don't realize like fascia, which I, is also interchangeable, interchangeable with the term connective tissue. Fascia mm. is the reason that your shape and your structure is the way that it is. Like, we probably all grew up with the, the model of the skeleton that hangs by the strings, the little skeleton model. Yeah. And we've seen the pictures of the muscular system and it confuses our brain to think that these are separate systems or that the skeletal system holds itself together. All of this stuff is held together by fascia. So your bones are held together from tendons and ligaments which are mostly connective tissue and fascia. Your organs are being held in the right position because of fascia. So I, one of my favorite analogies, I do not know who originally said this. I learned it from the kinetics creator, Alicia Celeste, that if everything were to magically disappear out of your body except for fascia, so your muscles, your bones, your organs, everything, you would still largely look like you. That is how much connective tissue exists to hold you in place. And then on the flip side, if everything stayed in your body and only fascia disappeared, you would tumble to the floor in a pile of bones and goo. <laughs> so it's, it's this that is crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's this really incredible system that I could nerd out and talk for hours just about what it is, but that is essentially when we're talking like visual, that's what it is. <laughs> so, so bones, muscle and organs are actually kind of suspended in this connective tissue. Yes. Now is the fascia in my big toe connected to the fascia on the top of my head? Technically, yes, unless you've had surgery. Okay. So, Fascia is, the fascial system in its ideal state is one uninterrupted chain. Uh, it changes a little bit when you've had surgery because that's been cut. And when it heals, it's just not quite the same. Um, but for the most part, yes, it's all connected. There are certain strips that have more connection than others. So um, are you familiar with Thomas Myers and anatomy trains at all? A little bit. A little bit. So one of, one of the really big strips of fascia, it starts here at your forehead and it wraps around the back of your head, down your neck, down your spine, splits at your low back and goes all the way down each leg and attaches at your heel. So this one massive train um, has a little bit more mm -hmm. influence as far as figuring out where pain is coming from. Uh, for example, if you have a really bad headache right at the top of your forehead, I've loosened the fascia in people's calves and hamstrings and took their headache away because it's oh. one strip. Will that work with migraines? Uh, yeah, I've definitely worked with people with migraines. I haven't worked on anyone in real time though like when they've currently had one. But mm. I, I work on a lot of people that um, historically have had them. And it really helps to loosen that chain, as well as some of the things in the front part of the neck and chest as well. Interesting. You're talking about the middle of the forehead. So I'm thinking like, whenever I think I tend to, or if I'm stressed, I'll tend to crunch my forehead up. Am I impacting this fascial chain when I do that? or if we're crunching our brow? You know, I don't know. Do you get headaches on a normal basis? I don't, um, no. Okay. It, it likely is not enough to impact that chain. Um, if it was manifesting itself in a physical form, but you, you have to be scowling for a long time each and every day to to really crinkle all this fascia up in here. Okay. <laughs> There's also not as much. So uh, we mainly have bone. There's only this thinner layer of 
tissue on our heads. So there's not as much fascia as say like in your hamstring. There's tons and tons because it's wrapping around every single muscle fibril and fiber in chain, if that makes okay. sense. That makes sense. Yeah. So when I say I have back pain, it could be an issue with my fascia somewhere far away from the back. Is Absolutely. I, I think it helps to understand uh, pain is a signal that happens in your body. It's a signal that a threat is detected. It does not necessarily mean that you have physical damage to your body, which is a common misconception. So mm. your brain will react the same way to you crashing your mountain bike and sustaining physical injury, you know, like threat detected. We have a, we're bleeding from 10 different places. Uh, <laughs> but it will, it will also go off if, uh, say your pelvis is a little shifted and now your spine doesn't feel totally safe. Your, your brain's going to send that pain signal as like, Hey, this is a warning. Something does not feel quite right. And a threat's detected. Um, your body responds the same. So a lot of times people get confused, like, Oh no, my back hurts. The, the answer must be in my back. It must be this herniated disc. It must be whatever in this exact area. But more often than not, it is coming from a completely different space that's being affected either by fascia or stress and anxiety is another one. Um, kind of in the tune of our previous example, if you have chronic anxiety or something like PTSD, your body is not, has not let you know that the danger that you were experiencing has passed. And so according mm -hmm. to the internal environment of your body, danger is always either a possibility or it's currently happening. And that is going to also potentially light up a pain signal because that feels like a threat in your body. So if any type of threat is detected, that pain signal could go off. So I, I've seen that a lot with, with people with a lot of anxiety is that chronic pain, like full body aches and pains. Um, and I, I believe that's from the threat response. Interesting. So it would be like, sorry, Ian. <laughs> no, that's just, this is a cool tangent. Let's, let's keep going with this for a minute. So like an extreme case would be you're diffusing bombs in a war zone, right? And you're, or you're, you're in a war zone and you clench up to brace yourself for some sort of impact. You're engaging muscles, you're making changes to the fascia. And what you're saying is even whenever the real danger has left, these bodies of people with anxiety, um, high levels of stress or panic disorder, the bodies are stuck. And that's sending pain signals. Yes. Uh, an interesting role of fascia is it's, it's meant to protect you. It's, um, it's our shock absorbing system. And because uh. it is our shock absorbing system, it can contract independently of your muscles. So say you accidentally hit your elbow against a wall. If you didn't know that was coming, there's no time for your muscles to contract, right? It's your fascia that will contract to, uh, to use your perfect terminology, brace for impact and allow that shock to be distributed. Um, so what happens a lot of times is the fascia gets stuck in a contracted state. So even if your muscles don't feel clenched mm. or you don't physically feel that your muscles are contracted, your fascia could still be stuck in this contracted state when you're stressed because it's literally bracing for impact. It's fascinating. I, I did not know the fascia um, can contract. That's crazy. Um, so with people who are constantly stretching muscles, but still have pain, could it be that the fascia is still contracted? Yes. A hundred percent. Unfortunately, static stretching 
does very little to change fascia or it does so at an extremely annoyingly slow rate. So I know a lot of people are like, I've been doing these stretches for months and months and they either don't see a change or maybe it's very small that their pain is a little bit better. And it's because, yeah, if, uh, I know I was saying that fascia is not like a sausage, but for the sake of analogy, if sure. suddenly your shirt shrunk five sizes too small and you're stuffed in this tiny thing and then you're trying to stretch your muscles are you're not changing this shrunk up version of your shirt you've got to do another method to pull out your clothes back so that your muscles can move so a lot of times that's happening with stretching is people are cranking on their calf muscle or uh, their quad muscle uh, in order to lengthen the muscle fibers. And it's really straining your muscle uh, because the fascia is still locked into its very contracted state. And you've got to learn to specifically go after changing the fascia. Cool. So are there um, some quick or easy tips that people could try to target their fascia? Sure. My favorite tool in all of the land is a foam roller. <laughs> Most I have one people, around here. I, oh, do you have one? <laughs> I do. I could, I could go grab it, but yeah. It's cool. Um, a foam roller, hands down, is my favorite. There's tons of fancy fascia release tools that uh, at this stage of the game, I have a hilarious amount, but more often than not, I'm using a roller and most people are simply rolling back and forth on it, right? That is what you typically see at the gym, or maybe that's what you're doing on your own. Uh, but fascia needs two things. It needs a pretty substantial compression, and then it also needs to be cross-fibered. Um, these two specific things will help stimulate certain cells within your fascia that tell it to let go and create space. What does cross fiber mean when you say that? Most simplistically, whatever way your fibers are running, you want to go across them perfectly. Okay. So for example, since you can see my bicep, your bicep muscles, right? That most, most of the fibers are going up and down this way. So okay. if I put my bicep on a foam roller, I'm going to want to go side to side so that I'm going across those fibers. Cool. The compression and the cross fibers tells the fascia release, relax. Yes. Yes. So um, it's really interesting. I learned this maybe about a year ago. Fascia is a really new thing that is like just being more heavily researched in the last 50 years. And they, they just discovered a cell in the fascia that they're perfectly calling a fascia site. <laughs> right on point. Different, um, different than a fascist, right? <laughs> yes. Oh not, my gosh. Not at all related. <gasps> nope. <laughs> cool. But, but yeah, this fascia site uh, only responds and like get stimulated by this shearing slash cross fibering action. So if you're just compressing, it will do some, but for some reason, because of this one cell, as soon as you cross fiber your fascia, it kicks that one into action and then everything lets go. It's so interesting. Crazy. So, Is this, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, no, no go ahead. <laughs> Is this what masseuses do? Like, are they intentionally engaging the fascia? Your traditional masseuse? Uh, traditional, not a lot. Here's, here's the other side of this, and I realize this is an important part of it. Um, your nervous system is the thing in your body that tells you whether change is okay to happen. So if you're really upregulated and your nervous system is uh, feeling very tense, uh, what it, sympathetic nervous system mm -hmm. reaction things, 
um, change is unlikely to happen. Um, so sometimes with massage, really intense trigger point things can upregulate someone and that tissue may temporarily change because of the force. But a lot of times because your fascia wants to protect you, it will push that change back out and go back to its original form, which is why a lot of times you hear from people that a massage felt really great for a day or two and then their pain came right back or they felt the same way that they did before. Um, and the other side of the nervous system is if you yourself are creating the change, this is, this is an analogy for life, Ian, if you yourself are creating the change, it's so much more likely to stick than someone mm. forcing that change upon you, right? So a lot of times, I know, whoo, am I blown? If you yourself are creating the change, that change is more likely to stick. That reminds me of a quote. May I yes. share? Okay. Andrew Huberman, neuroscientist, doing a lot of how changes are made in the brains of children versus adults. When you're in a child, your brain can be changed by the forces all around you, your parents, siblings, etc. You can uh, create neural pathways and loops that can manifest in different behavioral patterns. But when you're an adult, those changes have to be initiated by you, the individual. They can still be made, but you have to do them yourself. And it sounds like you're saying the same um, when it comes to taking care of your body. In, in my experience, I've seen this, uh, like the doing of the motions yourself, like you're the one moving through the range of motion to cross fiber your fascia. It changes things so much faster. Mm. And I believe it's because your nervous system is engaged, allowing you to go through that range of motion and telling you that it's safe to go through that range of motion and changes happen. And a lot of times, like we live in a society, I know I said I was going to hold back on some of my rants for, about the Western medical system, but our Western medical system has taught us that we need other people to fix our problem. And sometimes that's true. Like if you are sick, like for the love of God, if you have Corona, go to the doctor. Or if you have an emergency, an accident, something that um, is serious, like you got in a car accident, things like that, Western medicine is amazing and it's needed. But when it comes to pain, it is failing miserably. And again, this, this projection onto us that like we need them to fix our pain has everybody stuck in this loop that they have to wait around for someone to fix them. And you actually will create more change if you go about doing it yourself. It's, yeah. it's amazing. And when you're a child, you do need somebody else to fix you, to help you or whatever. But as an adult, it's just not, <clears throat> not how it works. But I, I think a lot of people are still like, fix me, fix me. I go to this doctor, fix me, give me a pill, fix me, you know? So you're talking about the pain liberation Academy kind of transforms the individual's approach to um, just maintaining health and pain management in general from the, the Western, I go to a doctor to I am the doctor. Yeah, we're cutting out the pain management and we're going to pain elimination. I hate the word pain management. Cool. Ugh. And it what's the, so what's the key to, what's the pivotal point on that journey from management of pain, toning down symptoms to elimination? I know this sounds... It's going to sound really woo woo, but I really believe it's the decision that you make. I, if you are caught in a mental and neural loop that you're always going to be managing your pain and that that 
is cueing your body to assume that this pain is going to continue, I, you don't get anywhere. I've been in that loop. I had to have someone bust me out of that loop to realize change can happen. And that decision and that hope that I realized was completely possible, that was the pivotal moment for me being like, oh, I'm going to get rid of this thing now. It just, it has to be that breaking away from the mentality. Like that's, that's the first part of this program is deconditioning your mindset around pain and mm. all the drama that it holds and all of this, again, upregulation and this stuck pattern that you think it's never going to go away. Like we have to talk about that or we're not going to break through and, and just get rid of your pain. Very cool. It's very uh, empowering to think that's possible. So, I mean, I used to say, oh, my knee, my knee is just jacked. My, my knee pain, my knee injury. And year, if I, if I would have kept going down that path, I could have very much adopted that into my identity. And in a sense, do people get addicted to their pain stories? Yes. It, I'm sure it's really uncomfortable for people to admit, but sometimes you're, you're getting something out of it. You know, maybe you're getting attention or sympathy or an excuse to not go after something that you want and it becomes more comfortable mm -hmm. to stay where you are than to move forward. So I can be comfortable in pain. Yeah. I've been there. Very interesting. Yeah. It's, it's common, but I, luckily we live the good side of having so much more content out there now is there's a lot of people helping others realize like they hold this power to change themselves. So it's really exciting. Yeah. It must be great to hear for, from anybody who's dealing with any type of chronic pain, you know, there are people who have gone through it, who have been there, come back. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so is the, is pain liberation Academy focused on a particular type of pain or all across the board? Um, it's specifically for low back pain, uh, this round. Although I will say oh. that the tools and the protocol and the routines that we're doing could really help most things in the lower body. So if you have sciatic pain, hip pain, um, even knee pain or plantar fasciitis, it's mm -hmm. a fairly sim similar group of tools I would be giving. So um, if you're like, oh, I don't have low back pain, but I have hip pain, don't let that discourage you. Um, it could still be really helpful, but uh, things are being more framed through the low back pain lens this time around. Very cool. Awesome. So once the... Um program kicks off you start with mindset right and then where could you give us a, a little overview of some of the other places you take people yeah um yeah we we go over every possible angle in my expertise to help with this thing so um we will talk about mindset we'll talk about lowering any inflammation that we can through nutrition and we're we're talking basics mm. i'm not a dietitian um just things that can help reduce the internal inflammation in your body and can contribute to some of the achiness or sluggishness that you're feeling. Uh, and then of course, a large chunk about fascia and fascia patterns. So knowing all of these different possible patterns, again, hopefully gives you this understanding of where the root source of your pain is coming from. And once wow. you tackle the source, that's going to alleviate this nagging problem. And you know, for future, if for some reason it ever decides to come back, you know exactly what you need to do. And again, that's, that's the beauty of this taking out, uh, taking the fear out of pain is if you know what routine or protocol you need to do to tackle this thing, it's, it's no big deal. Um, so yeah, there'll definitely be a lot about pain patterns and 
how to release fascia on your own. Um, we'll also talk about posture and some other tools you can use to correct misalignments. Um, if you have, you know, one shoulder higher than the other, um, mm -hmm. that could be a problem that we for sure need to talk about uh, realigning to make sure that your pain doesn't come back. Um, and then lastly, we do talk some corrective exercises. I have a background as a corrective exercise specialist and feel it's important to integrate these changes and the newfound space in your fascia with strength. So we'll mm -hmm. talk about that as well. And it's going to be fun. It's, it's a group program. So we get oh. calls every week We're we're going to be there to support each other and ask tons of questions and just kind of like be together through this journey. And I'm so excited. It's going to be awesome. Awesome. You mentioned uh, food. I could mm -hmm. want to ask you a couple questions. So are there, are there foods I can eat that will decrease pain or are there foods I should avoid because they tend to increase pain? Both. Uh, some of it you may need to um, test some things out for yourself. Um, I'm going to be talking about like the top 10 most inflammatory things. You may be one of the people that can eat a couple of those things without. What, what are the top two? Sorry. Sugar. Top two. Okay. Sugar is well and away the first one. And then typically any type of processed grain. So mm. that tends to be a lot of glutens and, and things like that. But um, it depends. It depends on the person, but those two, if you cut out a lot of that, it's your internal inflammation goes down substantially. And that may or may not be the specific cause of say your back pain, but I want people to have every possible tool to keep their body in the lowest inflammatory state throughout this program. So I like to start with a lot of those things to make sure that um, we're just slowly decreasing that as the program goes on. Oh, could gluten be contributing to my um, felt sense of pain, even if I'm not, um, you know, allergic to gluten or, a, or I haven't been diagnosed with, what's the condition? I think it's celiac. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a difference between um, being allergic to something and having an intolerance for something. Yeah. So, uh, for example, I am very corn intolerant. Uh, I'm not allergic to corn. I don't have an allergic reaction. I don't need an EpiPen. There's nothing serious mm. about it. But I have found when I eat corn, I break out. My body puffs up enough. I can't get my rings off. Like they just are mm. stuck to my hand. And I, I have a clearly inflammatory response when I have it. And that's not an allergy. It's just an intolerance. So you may find that you have a lot of foods that you're intolerant to. Um, that, yeah, you don't need to go to a doctor for, but avoiding them will help keep your inflammation down. And if your immune system is not working so hard to keep your inflammation down from what you're eating, it can then go and help aid the healing of the pain that you're feeling. So that is Interesting. the other goal. Cool. So what are some foods, um, that would decrease inflammation? In the body? Uh, turmeric is one really powerful one. Um, a lot of times cinnamon, black pepper, um, anything heavy in antioxidants, if it's organic, like blueberries and raspberries, um, lots of berries are very anti-inflammatory as well. Um, and yeah, just adding, adding these little things can make a big difference to you. Like you're cutting, of course, but even just boosting your ability to um, get rid of some of that inflammation by adding things to your diet help as well. So I'm thinking of uh, India. They have a lot of turmeric in their foods. Have you noticed um, like in terms of different cultures or areas, uh, are, is there a less, a lower incidence of chronic pain in different cultures around the globe? You know, I don't know. 
I don't know the answer to that. It would be really interesting to see. I, I know they say, uh, you know, certain types of diets are associated with less disease, like a Mediterranean diet and things like that. But I'm not super familiar when it comes to research about a specific culture. I don't know. Interesting. Cool. So you're going to take people through a diet screen, basically, to manage the pain. Mm -hmm. And then through um, learning about the fascial connections for the particular pain they're going through, what comes after that? Um, yeah, so I'll also teach you how to map your body, which is important if you have a misalignment. So um, we'll talk about not just possible patterns, but like your specific pattern and how you can figure out your specific pattern on your own with your fascia release tools. Um, and then we're gonna go into some more intricate posture alignment. That's sort of stage three of four, um, where we do add a couple of movements and a couple of stretches because stretches are more effective if you release fascia first. Um, to realign as much of your posture as possible and talk about good biomechanics, especially if you're spending a lot of time sitting or slouching, things like that. And then the last step is uh, the corrective exercise step, which at that point where it's like a chair, the cherry on top to this whole thing is just like, here are some tools and some exercises that you can use to build strength around the changes that we've made so that they stay in the right place. But yeah, most of most of this, the bulk of this program is absolutely about fascia and the fascia release component. Very cool. Yeah, crazy stuff. So if I, if somebody wanted to um, sign up or learn more about the program, where should they go? I am most active, ironically, since this is a Facebook live, uh, <laughs> I'm most active on Instagram. So you can follow me at movement by Julia and uh, send me a DM. Uh, I think, Ian, you have a link that people can schedule a call if they want that we can drop in the comments later. Um, I, I do want to talk to you before you join just to make sure that it's a perfect fit for you and your goals. So um, I would love for you to reach out and open a dialogue so that we can talk about it. Awesome. And the program kicks off on the 17th? Yeah, next uh, week from today, Monday. So a couple spots left. If awesome. you're waiting for a sign. This is the sign. <laughs> this is the sign. Upgrade your fascia and your life. Yeah. And then uh, my announcement to anyone that saw my story earlier that was like, oh, I haven't told anyone this yet. Special announcements. Special announcement. Uh, this guy right here, Ian, is going to be doing a breathwork session during this program to teach you how to downregulate with both stress and even pain. And I'm super pumped to have you there to talk people through this like bonus seminar that comes with this program because any possible tools we can give people for managing uh, this like tendency to be upregulated and to help their pain, it's gonna be awesome. Absolutely. Okay. I'm very stoked. I'm gonna talk to you about how to breathe properly um, throughout the day so you can downregulate, how to make sure you're engaging the diaphragm which if you aren't using it could be impacting your low back pain and we're going to throw in a special breathwork journey which is a potent down regulator and uh, i'm looking forward to connecting with everybody on all those topics i know that breathwork stuff is so cool i did it for the you yeah yeah you had an experience how was it Woo! it was intense and awesome I have never experienced anything quite like that, to be honest. Uh, I felt like it was a time warp. Uh, it felt like we had only been working on that for 10 minutes and it was 20. It's like, yeah. I lost 10 minutes of my life, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it was so interesting. I, my arms were briefly asleep for a while and kind of stuck in, what did you call them, lobster claws? It's the lobster claws, yeah. yeah. It's common. <laughs> it's safe, perfectly yeah. safe. I don't want to scare anyone. It was, it was just such a fascinating experience. And then coming out on the other side, I have 
I've never felt so calm and was aware that my lungs and my ribs were moving in a completely different way. Like, I think the first thing I said to you was like, I feel like the fascia in my rib cage and my thoracic spine is completely unstuck. It's like, it just, by simply breathing and integrating, um, expanding consistently, it changed the fascia again, cause we're doing the work ourselves. I have no doubt that that is a real thing that was happening. So it was really cool. And I can't wait to do your class on Wednesday too. Awesome. Yeah. Wednesday. So today is August 10th on August 12th. I'm doing a breathwork journey, uh, at 6 30 PM Pacific hit me up. If you're interested in that, I'd love to have you there. And uh, if you do attend that, you also get a free course on how to optimize breathwork journeys, uh, as well as an audio recording of that. So awesome. Julia, thank you so much for having this conversation. This was mind blowing. Thank you and... for having me and hearing me go off on tangents. What, 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 uh, what else is life about? Let's go out on ta tangents, go out on limbs. True. Cool. It was awesome. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Julia. See you on the flip. Right. Oh. You still there? Oh, yep. Sorry. My.